Being lost in the woods is terrifying. When you go out planning a camping trip or a hiking trip or something along those lines and end up not being where you thought you were supposed to be, it can definitely be creepy. In these 10 tales, people share their stories of being deep in the woods and running into things they didn't expect to see. Today, joining me is Creeks and Peaks. Please show her some love on her channel if you enjoy this. Her link is in the description and the pinned comment below. To give this story some context, I need to state a few details about myself. My name is Jay, and I am 17 years old from the UK. I had a close friend. From the age of 13 to 16, he was my closest friend, and we did everything together. His name was John. We were both massively into wilderness survival, so we planned a trip to Scotland to spend a week alone in the forest to get a real survival experience. We were both really excited and invested in all the equipment needed to bring with us, as our parents wouldn't let us go without the correct safety measures. To give a brief idea of what we took, here is a list of the main items we took. A tent, a small combat knife each, a camping stove, rations, and miscellaneous items such as rope, blankets, etc. After a long, dull, 10-hour car journey, we eventually made it to the edge of the forest. We were sent to venture in. My heart raced with excitement as I starved to get into the forest ahead. It was a lush green with flowers scattered around the floor. It was everything I imagined and more. We lugged our rucksacks onto our backs and started the long walk to where we planned to camp. It was a good eight mile hike to get to the lock where we planned to camp near. I believe it was called Lock and Rye or something along those lines. So we were ready for a three to four hour walk. This didn't faze me at all as I was excited that I'd finally get to camp in the wild as where I live there weren't really any places that you can camp away from other people. John was equally as happy as I was with a wide smile across his face. After about an hour of walking, we stopped to take a break and had something to eat and drink. We were sat on a large rock in the middle of a clearing in the woods. Surprisingly, it was a nice day and the sun was shining through the trees onto us. As we ate, we noticed a deer carcass about 20 feet away. Upon closer inspection, we found that it was pretty fresh, a day or two old at most, and the way it had died was definitely not natural. A large, deep gash ran across its neck and his hooves had been cut off, as well as his eyes being removed, leaving deep, empty sockets with flies buzzing in and out. Me and John were curious what had truly happened, but just guessed that it was some messed up kids or something as we were only an hour deep into the forest. After that encounter, we moved on and completely forgot about it. After another three hours of walking, we arrived at the lock. It was a beautiful clear body of water with large fish swimming around. We found a flat patch of land and I proceeded to set up the tent to our camp as the night was drawing close. After about half an hour, we had camp set up and a fire made. After a quick meal, we went straight to bed as we were exhausted from the walk. For the first few days, nothing suspicious happened. We just built shelters and hunted to our heart's content. But on the fourth night, I left the camp to take a pee. After walking a good 50 meters away, I stopped to pee. When I looked up, I was horrified to see another deer, exactly the same as the other one that me and John had found on the way here. I shrieked and ran back to our camp. My heart was racing as I thought of all the reasons why it could have been there, and that close to our camp. What was happening? What if whoever did that finds us? Will we suffer a similar fate? I returned to find John putting the fire out as he was about to get into the tent. I caught my breath and John asked what was up. I grabbed him and jumped into the tent. What are you doing? John said in his usual loud voice. I hushed him and explained about the deer. He laughed and brushed it off as a joke, thinking that I was trying to scare him. I tried telling him that I wasn't joking, but he just laughed and said prove it. There was no chance in hell that I was going back in that direction. As John reached for the zipper on the tent, a faint chanting started. It must have been in the distance, but it was enough to spook us both. 
we both grabbed for our little combat knives and clutched them as if it would bring us safety. The chanting grew louder and louder, and we decided that we needed to get the hell out of there. We grabbed our small emergency rucksacks and unzipped the tent floor. To our horror, there was around four cloaked figures just 15 feet away from us. We both froze in horror for a moment until one of the figures started to move forward. We freaked out and bolted away, but there was one more of these figures on the other side of our tent. We dashed through the two of the smaller ones. They tried to reveal that they were wielding jagged knives. This sight made my heart sink, and I pushed my leg as hard as I could. The next time we looked back, we finally lost them. My heart was racing. What kind of sick people would do that? Was it some kind of sick joke? I was glad that I escaped with my life as I know that I am not the strongest runner. John looked at me with fear still in his eyes and asked, What the hell just happened? I couldn't reply as I was so exhausted from running. We spent the rest of the night hiding up in a tree until the sun rose. Then we immediately went back to the road and called to be picked up, leaving all our gear behind. We didn't report to the police as we thought they simply wouldn't believe us. Till this day, I still wonder what those people were actually doing out there. Was it simply animal sacrifices or worse? Until now, I haven't been able to share my story as I thought no one would believe me. To give some backstory to this, I am currently a 23-year-old male that has spent a substantial amount of time in the woods. I hunt, fish, prefer swimming and legs to chlorine, grew up in western Pennsylvania, playing capture the flock and release in the woods with the neighborhood kids. Before this story, I have never felt uncomfortable, nervous or like I wasn't the top of the food chain. In the middle of 2015, I decided to take a girl I was seeing to Raccoon State Park in western Pennsylvania for a picnic. We parked at the camp office and headed down the main park road towards the trails away from the lake. We made our way up the trail road and I decided to head right at the fork up the gravel service road. We get up to a trailhead that I was familiar with that I knew had a nice clearing with a few benches, just a short hike back into the woods, give or take a mile and a half. When we got to the park benches, we both mentioned it was kind of quiet. I shrugged it off and opened up my bag to start cooking. As the grill heated up, I was preparing the meat and veggies. She started getting nervous. She kept saying she did not like this part of the woods, she wasn't comfortable, etc. I didn't notice anything. I attributed this to the fact that she grew up in Miami and never really went into the woods. As the kebabs are on the grill, I start to hear movement in the woods. Assuming it was a rabbit or other small animal, I started making jokes about her being afraid of a bunny. As we are eating, I start to feel very uneasy. I told Kate that after we were done eating, we should head back down towards the lake. We begin to hear more rustling from farther down the trail. She gets very nervous and start asking if we can go to the lake now. I decide to head down the trail a little ways to show her nothing is wrong. Still. Assuming it was some small critter, I head down the trail about a hundred yards and it's obvious that this part of the trail had not been recently used. The further down the trail I go, the more I start to feel something is weird. The quiet mixed with the feeling of I am definitely not the top of the food chain freaked me out. I get back to the benches and she tells me that she feels like she has been watched. She insists on heading back down to the car. She is unnerved to the point that the lake isn't an option. I agree and back up to begin heading down. On the way out, we are moving quickly. I still feel like I am prey 
and she is insisting that something is watching us. As we get to the service road, whatever was making the noise in the foliage was not only staying with us, but was getting louder. I am convinced whatever was making those noises had to be large, bigger than a man. Neither of us ever saw what was in the woods. I am convinced whatever was in those woods was not any animal. I have every herd in the woods of Pennsylvania and definitely was not human. I, to this day, believe I was being hunted by something and refused to return to that portion of the park. I live in eastern Finland, in a small city. Most of the cities here are like openings or holes in a forest. If you looked at them down from the sky, in the Finnish folklore, there are many stories of forest creatures and spirits that guard the forest and lead people astray. There are even stories of forest shrouding a person so that he or she gets lost in it for years. That there is an upside down world, and that where all kinds of wondrous and scary ancient things live. There are stories of a lot of people going into the forest shroud and making it out years later with odd stories to tell. There's this birch forest near my home. A black river streams through it, and it floods in the spring. I usually walk the dog in there because I think it's beautiful. Birch tree forests aren't that common over here, and the trees are old. Some of them are huge, old, and full of fungi and twisted. Sometimes I take the kids there too. My daughter is very sensitive in a way. From an early age, she's been seeing and talking to imaginary things. Some of them which were odd. For example, my now dead grandmother. My daughter, she never met her, but often talked about her. One day, when we were eating out for dinner, she just stood up, looked out the window, and burst into tears and cried. Goodbye, Mama. That was the end of the imaginary friend that we thought was my grandmother. It's curious because I think my daughter kind of reminds me of her too. One time, during the day when we were walking among the birch woods, my daughter said that there was somebody there. A dead horse named Lotta. She told me that it was a very old horse and it lived there. I laugh to her. I'm just used to these kind of stories from her. I smile, shrug, and laugh at them. But there's always this weird undertone to them. The stories are fantastic and imaginative, but eerily consistent. Like an unconscious hint of a memory. I think she's just a smart child with a good imagination. But when she cries at night, and I walk into the room, I find her sleepwalking and pointing at an empty chair in the middle of the room, with her tiny index finger. It feels uncanny, like there's something between the lines. A couple of months ago, it was a full moon and I was walking my dog at night. I was going for a walk in the birch forest. The moon painted the frost bluish. As I approached the forest, the birch trees rose from the frozen ground like these white upside down runs, and behind them, just black with hints of more white sides on the trees. It must have been like a hundred meters away when I heard something from the dark forest. Something heavy was moving around there, crashing away in the forest. Sometimes, I've heard the rabbits scream in there when a lynx or a fox gets them. The rabbits scream like a small child when they are dying, but this was something different. A wild boar, maybe a moose. The dog was also interested in the sounds. Its ears pointed upwards. We walked closer to the white trees and the noises got louder. We both stopped to look. The dog didn't bark, it just pointed its nose towards the sound. We were like 20 meters away from the tree line when the sound stopped. For a while, it was just quiet. Then it started again. Something started running in the forest, near the tree line. Not from us, but toward us. It gives me chills just remembering this. Heavy, amazingly fast steps. I started to think it was a bipedal according to the sounds it made. 20 to 30 meters in... It made only a couple of sounds. 
in the pitch black and on uneven forest ground, somehow it was making up so much ground without tripping or anything, between the trunks and overfallen trees and bushes. It's not a human being. It's not a moose, I remember thinking. My dog's head accordingly turned to the movement. And then it stopped. Right before us, I felt the darkness staring at me and I stared back. For sure, I wasn't going in the forest with my dog, but something dark was facing us. Just to the left of the path, I was going to walk to enter the forest. It was making sounds in front of us. I started on my way back from the tree line, still facing the woods and the sounds. Whatever was in there, it was very interested in us, but I didn't seem to want to come out of the forest. I wasn't going to turn my back to it, that's for sure. My hands curled into fists. The dog had his tail between his legs as we backed away. The sounds continued. I could hear them even from over 100 meters away. It was then that I turned my back on it and started walking away. I walked fast, thinking all the possible forms of the darkness could have just been anything and maybe it was my imagination playing on me. The terror I felt was real. I rushed to my home and locked the door. Even my wife got nervous seeing me spook like that. I've been in the forest almost every night since then, walking the dog, and I've never seen anything or heard anything since. But I've always been on alert since that night, wondering if not knowing what that was might be hazardous. I've never seen or heard anything since that night, and I've never heard or seen anything move so fast through the woods before. But then I think about the dead horse my daughter said she saw. I know little children see things, but I also know their interpretations of things might be off. They see more than us adults who have learned to see the world around us in a certain way, but therefore lacking the ability to describe it. Maybe she didn't see a dead horse at all, but something that she couldn't describe in any other way. I have had an unusual experience with my husband. We have fished at a lake for the past six years. We live within a two-hour drive from Yosemite, and this lake is surrounded with cattle pastures along one side, with a dam, and the other side of the lake is all fishing and camping areas. This one day, instead of going on the public side of the lake, we hiked across the dam and set up our stuff on the pasture across the lake. This area is known for snakes, so we carefully checked the trees and rocks and grass, found it to be safe, and kicked back to enjoy our day of fishing. Now, people often hike to this area to fish, and the property owners don't mind much, so long as you pick up after yourself and don't start any fires, a high-risk fire area due to drought and dry grass. We were there for about an hour, no high winds, no boats on the water, yet, middle of the week during school time, and about as quiet as a country lake can get. I noticed at first a high-pitched buzzing, like angry bees, but metallic sounding, my husband noticed it a few seconds later. It started getting louder, and we began looking for a swarm of bees or other flying pests. Nothing. There were no flies. Bees. Nothing was flying. Nothing. Just that buzzing noise. The noise kept getting louder and louder, but the few people on the other side of the lake weren't responding to it. It was loud enough that we had to shout to each other to be heard. The other people should have noticed it too and have been reacting to it. We kept looking around, even at the sky for a drone or a helicopter. But that day had clear cloud-free skies with no drone or helicopter activity either. The buzzing got louder and we both put our hands over our ears at that point I noticed a feeling of oppression, weight, fear, basically my mind brain telling me to run like hell, 
but being so scared, I couldn't move. My husband dropped to his knees, as did I, and I began crying. I just remember hearing the buzzing, and like my mind couldn't think of anything but the noise. My husband later told me that he felt the same thing. So here we were, on our knees with our ears covered, crying. Then the noise just locked off, like it moved away. When it stopped completely, we grabbed our stuff and ran. For the rest of the day, we both suffered from ringing ears, numbness in our faces and ears and tingling in our hands and feet, like they were asleep. It took 24 hours for this to go away. Has anyone else experienced this phenomenon? Is this common? We haven't heard of another case of this out there. We even went back to the same spot several times, and it never happened again. A few years ago, my friend, let's call her Stacy, wanted to go to her dad's vacation home. It was a nice place, there was a lot of wilderness and the house was one of those classic wood pillars holding the thing up almost the entire front half was glass, which was great because it really gave you this nice look of trees outside. There were tons of neat things you could do out there. You could go rock climbing, have a nice evening stroll in the woods. Her dad even had a kit for making s'mores, but that's not what I'm here to tell you guys about. I went up there with Stacy and two of her friends. I'll refer to them as Emma and Ashley. I was the only guy. Now please don't get the wrong idea. Just because I'm the one guy and amongst a bunch of girls doesn't mean that I was going to try anything with them. I am a homosexual male. You can say that's how I met Stacy. She had a lot of trouble with boyfriends. Anyway, we got there and all of us searched the home. It was as cool and as nice as we thought it would be. Though, we were something a little off. Something about the place felt heavy. The woods were quiet, which was weird because those were usually the first thing you could hear coming out here. We shrugged it off and went swimming in the lake later on. It was late afternoon and I was getting ready to head back when Stacy called me over. When I got there, I noticed that Emma was crying. I asked her what was wrong, but she was too upset to say anything. Stacy told me that they were talking and laughing when Emma suddenly grew pale. She remained frozen while Stacy was asking her what was wrong. The next she, she knew, Emma began crying. I thought this was strange. Emma was the most outrageous girl in the group. She constantly threw herself at me and rubbed her leg against me. She teased me because she knew I didn't like it, but seeing her so startled was frightening. We headed back before it got too dark and settled. Emma was now on the couch, and with a blanket, she had no emotion. Stacy and I were talking while Ashley went outside for a smoke. We were laughing about something when Emma suddenly spoke up. D did you see it crawling? We were confused and asked her what she was on about. It was crawling on the other side of the lake, watching us. I had no idea what she was talking about. Ashley began yelling for us to come out. Me and Stacy went, but Emma stayed on the inside and began to cry again when we left her. Ashley was pointing off into the trees. She looked spook. I saw a man out there, peeping out behind those trees. He's watching me smoke. Stacy got angry. She's not the type of girl to get spooked easily. There's a freaking pervert watching us. She snapped and went back inside and came out with her dad's rifle. She used to go shooting with him, and she was a damn good aim. We were only planning on scaring the guy away, but if anything happened, then that gun would be good for protection. I'm not familiar with guns, so I just walked beside her as she and Ashley went towards the bush. We walked out for a while. Ashley had a flashlight and Stacy had one of her guns. We couldn't see anyone, and we realized that we had gone too far. I walked a bit ahead and turned to them. We should go back. I think we spooked him enough. I didn't even notice them step back. All of the color from their faces disappeared, and when I saw Ashley start to tear up, 
I didn't know what I was expecting when I turned around, but when I did, I really wish I didn't. It was naked. It had yellow eyes and they were dinged red at the corners. Its hair was almost completely gone. Its skin was white and scabby and its teeth. Dear God, they were the most horrible thing I've ever seen on a person. They were long and thin, covered in dry blood. Stacy fired at it and the thing bolted off. I watched the thing and didn't even realize that the girls had started running. I tried to catch up with the moving light and their cries. It was hard for me and I eventually had to stop and catch my breath. I lost the track but I was still terrified of running into that thing. I was close to the lake and I hid under the dock. The moon gave me enough light to see the water near my feet and it slightly illuminated the trees nearby. A second later I heard a thud on top. By this point I was tearing up. I thought it was going to die. The thing stalked back and forth and I could hear it sniffing hurriedly. The damn thing was trying to smell me out. There was a sound in the trees and then the thing instantly jumped off. I watched it run in all fours towards the place and I didn't wait for it to come back and finish me. I ran, not even wanting to find the lights of their torches. I just wanted to get to the house. I knew the way back from the lake and I found it. All the lights were off. As soon as I ran to the door it flew open and Ashley pulled me in. We all huddled in the far room. We were all trying to keep as quiet as possible and listen to the thing stalk across the front porch. We heard the knob rattle a few times but it was locked. We didn't get any sleep that night. Minutes before the sun came up, we heard the front porch tire squeak and the weight of it quickly rise up again as the thing jumped off. We waited until it was bright outside and gathered all of our things. We hightailed it out of there. When there were no more trees, we began to get further into town. We finally spoke up. I was sitting in the back with Stacy when she turned and asked me, How did you get away? What do you mean? I asked. I finally swallowed the lump in my throat that had been there all night. When we were in the woods, we saw it creeping behind you. It was looking right at you. It was watching you across the lake too, Emma added. My stomach sat heavy. Was the thing after me the whole time and that's why it followed me to the dock? To this day, I believe it was my gender, which singled me out. This thing wanted something that was rare to catch in a group, mostly occupied by females. I haven't been back there since and I don't plan on going back, ever. This story happened when I was around 8 years old, and even confirmed it with my mother recently. A long time ago, my grandfather built a wooden cabin into the woods so my family could spend some time with nature. No electricity, no running water, not even toilets. Anyways, since the only thing to do was play outside, I explored the area a lot. The only rule was that if I didn't see the cabin through the trees anymore, I have to come back. When this happened, I was pretty experienced in navigating myself through the forest, so I dared to break the rule and this time, go as far as I was comfortable with. I told myself that if I was doing this, I'd walk in a straight line to be sure not to get lost, even when I didn't see the cabin anymore. So I started my little exploration, and sure enough, after a couple of minutes, I couldn't see the cabin through the trees and continued forward. Some time passed and I noticed something in the distance. A wooden fence. At the time, I was already pretty sure no one lived in that direction, and even less so to our cabin. So, I went to check it out. Suddenly, I heard a dog bark repeatedly. When I reached the fence, there were some little holes in them as most wooden fences do, and I looked through it. I could see a dark and short furred dog barking at me in a small house. It was nothing impressive. It really was just a regular small house with one floor, and maybe an earth basement, but I couldn't really tell. My first reaction was to tell myself that someone built a house on our land illegally and thought they wouldn't get caught. So I ran back home, like if the house was going to disappear, and found my mother in the front yard. I spit a torture and told her everything, and obviously she said there was no way someone could have built the house here without us knowing, and thought I was joking or something. But I insisted so much that she decided to ask my brother to follow me so I could show him the house. And my previous fear got real. The house had completely vanished. I searched to finally see the wooden fence again. It couldn't be that far since I went in a straight line. 
but nothing. My brother just got bored and told me we were going back, and my mom told me we didn't find anything and the experience stopped there. But a couple of years later, I was talking to my father about the land and he told me we weren't the first to own it, as there were other people living here long times ago, in little houses that were on one or two old farms, but nothing was left of them except ruins. I visited these ruins and realized that at the time, that is what I saw. It was one of those small homes who were standing here long times ago, lost in the middle of the woods. So about three years ago when I was 17, I took my then girlfriend during the day to a little known wooded area with a beautiful waterfall near my house. The place used to be a train yard in the late 1800s and still has tracks that cross through the woods, albeit these tracks are completely covered by foliage at this point. It's really quite an amazing and beautiful area that I spent a lot of my time exploring, so I was completely at home in the woods. While I love the area, it was the kind of place you are still careful at after dark. It's not in a great neighborhood, and a lot of creepy gangs and groups of unsavory characters have been known to hang out there. The graffiti suggests a lot of white supremacist groups and more than a few junkie groups. After we relaxed at the waterfall for a while, I decided to show my girlfriend some of the other cool parts of the woods, like a train track bridge over the waterfall's river. Coming away from there, there is a huge pit in the ground, around 20 feet across, that neither me nor my friends could ever figure out what it was for. In the center, was always a metal slab that looked like it had scorch marks from quite a hot fire. And these marks were always new, although no one had ever seen people use it before. This is how the pit got the name, the Sacrifice Pit. It's actually really creepy how accurate that name is when you're looking at it. About 20 feet wide and 3 feet deep with a plate large enough to hold a person tied down in the middle. As I'm explaining this to my girlfriend, and we're standing next to the pit, an older lady probably about in her 50s walks out of the woods. We had not seen her coming, or heard her for that matter, and she just sort of appeared. Then a little boy who couldn't have been more than four appeared behind her. It was almost surreal. The lady had tattered clothing and an incredibly creepy smile, yellow teeth and all. The child just kept looking at us with a cold stare. He never moved once, just kept staring at us with those empty eyes. So. The lady gives us a creepy smile again and points to the pit and says, Enjoying the view. Me and my girlfriend just kind of look at each other and said, Yeah, it's a beautiful day. She gives me that creepy smile again and says, Yes, it is. Try not to get lost in the woods now. Or something of that sort. And immediately turns back and goes back into the woods from the direction she came. The child who had been staring the whole freaking time with those empty eyes stares for a second or two more, then follows her back into the woods. Needless to say, we hightailed it the hell out of there. I've never been back to that place after, and I don't think I'll ever be able to get my girlfriend to go there again. So this happened a few months ago, and I'm still scared to this day. So my entire life, I had never really walked home from school all the way. I'd always either been picked up or ridden the bus. So this year was my first year that I lived near the school to walk. I wasn't in the nearby neighborhood where 90% of the kids were. We were only living in our house temporarily, so I have to walk maybe a half mile to get home, across the highway. So at the beginning of the year, when I first started walking home, I didn't want to have to walk by the highway. The high school had a cut through in the forest that led to a strange and creepy lone road. I wanted to be cool and get home fast, even though it was way faster just to go on the highway, which isn't that bad, so I walked down across the forest to get to the cut through point. I see some older kids following me, but perhaps I'm just being paranoid. I ignored them and they turned out to be unimportant. In my head for some reason I had the Halloween theme stuck in my head, like when he is stalking them. Sorta of eerie, right? But what was important was that my gut feeling that maybe I should have taken the highway. I blamed all my gut feelings on those older kids and kept walking. Eventually, I cut through the forest and get to this road. It is gravel with some dead grass in the middle. 
I see where the highway is, but the road seemingly extends deep into the Brambley Forest. I decide this is a waste of time, and I take the highway. But the next day, I didn't want to give up. I wanted to conquer this road, so I foolishly went back to the road. Same sort of thing. An eerie, alone road with dead shrubs growing in it. I keep walking down the eerie road. I notice that there are zero cars coming up or down this road. It like it was abandoned. I kept walking into a big spider web on the middle of the road, which proved that there hadn't been cars here very often or for a long time. Otherwise, there'd be no webs. I continue walking down the road. It leads nowhere. It just keeps going deeper. I'm starting to get a bit scared at this point. Any car could drive down this road and take me, and nobody would ever hear me scream. I start jogging back to the road to the center. I saw a big gap in the forest where the power lines were. Finally, I thought to myself, the ground next to the lines was still overgrown and full of ticks and tall grass, not to mention thorns and sticks. I kept walking down the area, and I was taking my sweet time. I finally made it into a small ravine in the middle of the area. I jumped over it and continued my way. I eventually get stuck around a big bush, because I didn't want to walk through the tall grass and get dirty. I must have been trying to work around the bush for two minutes, and then it slammed on me stone cold. I look up and see a man standing a good distance away from me. I don't move, and I don't say a word. My heart is pounding. This dude has a creepy dark green rugged shirt, shaggy brown hair, and just overall creepy. He is staring at me and he grins. His face literally fucking grinned. He gestured for me to come over to him, and then he fucking steps to the side where I can no longer see him, and I hear leaves crunching. He's coming after me. The adrenaline was pumping through my heart. I bolt like lightning, fast up that fucking hill. I don't care about not getting dirty anymore. I just want to get the fuck out of there. I finally make it to the road and get to the highway. I turn back and see no sign of the creepy dude. I make it home and promise to myself that I'm never going to the woods again. The scary thing is though, that he had just stepped to the side of the forest, I would have never seen him. I could have made it up that hill and he could have grabbed me, and I would have never have seen him again. Or the fact is that I live nearby. The creepiest part was that he grinned at me and made this really creepy gesture and then came towards me. Now any normal adult would have said, hey are you lost and can I help you? Obviously it could be a lie but still, but nope, this guy watched me for who knows how long. I'll never go down that road again, and I hope I never get lost in the woods like that again. So this was back when I was about 15 or 16. I was riding my dirt bike around the woods and I wanted to explore a bit. I was tired of riding the same trails, so I drug my bike under an old gate and rode up this washed out road. I saw this little hill that looked like it would be an awesome thing to jump. So I got off my bike and climbed it to make sure that there wasn't anything I could hit if I jumped it. As soon as I got to the top, I got a weird feeling that I can't explain. It was a sunny hot day, but everything was shaded, and it was cool there. I felt really comfortable like I belonged there, so I decided to explore a little more. It was a little half the size of a football field, and there were some rocks in the middle, and everything was covered with little green vines. So. I decided to lay down on the rocks and relax. Laying there felt like time stopped. I couldn't have been there for more than five minutes when I got this strange feeling that I needed to leave. I jumped up and looked around and it was darker and the green vines had all turned a brownish color. I couldn't remember how to leave so I ran to one side looking over and didn't see the road. I ran back to the other side and saw the road but the hill looked like it was 10 feet taller and steeper. I grabbed a little tree and dropped off holding it and letting it go. I hit the ground, grabbed my bike, and still couldn't remember how to leave, but I wasn't staying there, so I just took off. I grew up riding on this mountain, and there are only four places you can come out. I ended up coming out on the opposite side of the mountain and the road down to a friend's house. I told him about my experience, and he told me to talk to his uncle. His uncle was around 45 years old and went hunting ginseng out here when he was a kid. He knew every inch of the mountain, but he said two years ago, before he was hunting ginseng, he found a similar spot. He got lost and ended up spending 7 hours trying to find his way back out. His brother was worried, because he was supposed to meet back at the truck and never showed up. 
It's like there was something there luring you within a false sense of peace when you're relaxed and it strikes. He said his grandma used to tell him stories of a witch that lived up on the mountain, and I don't know about that, but it scared me. Here's my story. My cousin and I were out in the woods behind her house, and we were just messing around. We thought we would try to hand at making one of those cheesy YouTube horror series. So we both started recording on our phones. Well, as it was starting to get dark, the two of us decided to separate for plot purposes. And we got to this clearing area. She was supposed to scream. So she takes off running as planned and I'm trying to catch up to her. Well, then I actually got lost. I couldn't find the trail that we had come down on there. And I started yelling her name because she wasn't supposed to go too far. She should have still been able to hear me, but she didn't answer. Then I heard her scream, which was planned, and then I yell back, Where are you? I can't find the trail. And she yells, I'm at the road. So, I'm still lost, and I start texting her, telling her to come back, but she wouldn't answer any of my texts or calls. And right about the time that she calls back, I had finally found the trail again, and was walking down a hill. I told her that I heard her yell that she was at the road, and I was on my way there. And then she tells me that she didn't say that. I didn't believe her though. I was like, I heard you say it, quit messing around. Then I tripped and fell and dropped the phone and then picked it back up, laughing at my clutch self. And she asked me, who is that? And so that she hears a man's voice on my end. I never got any proof of that though. At this point, she tells me she's coming back and it wasn't a few seconds later that she walks over the hill and we hang up our phones and head back to home together. We were just thinking that we got ourselves all worked up because we were trying to film something scary, but that's... We were just never able to come up with an explanation for how I got lost and who that man could have been. Hey guys, before we get into this middle of nowhere camping stories, I just wanted to say that I'm going to be giving away three $25 Amazon gift cards to say thank you for all the support over the past year. All you have to do to enter is check out the pinned comment below. There will be a link with all the information that you need. We were teenagers. We were in love. This was in the late 90s before cell phones and prepaid AOL internet. Our parents were protective of us. He was captain of the football team and I was cheer captain. We were heavily regulated by parents and coaches, but still had our bad streak. We knew what we wanted to get down. We got the great idea that we would steal some alone time if we hit a tent during the day in a city forest. We decided we would hide a tent, set it up, and return after the game in the dark. We set up the pop-up tent, two sleeping bags, two fleece blankets, two pillows, three extra tent spikes, a mag light, condoms, and two bottles of water. All set. After the game, we told our parents that we were going for ice cream for a few hours. We drove down to a rural public launch site where we could walk 20 minutes into the woods to our little camp. We got there, started making out in the dark and turned into crazy heart pounding awesomeness. I stopped. I told him to stop. I heard footsteps outside of our tent. I prayed it was a deer, but then it was clearly bipedal and I prayed for a bear. Then I heard the man breathing. I smelled a cigarette. Neither of us smoked. We put our clothes on. I picked up a tent stake and shoved it in my boyfriend's hand and he stood up and saw his wallet in the corner of the tent and shoved it to his pocket. I picked up one of each of the remaining tent stakes in my hands. The footsteps stopped. I unzipped the tent quickly, my boyfriend pushed me out in front of him, what a gentleman, and I have another story following that. We ran through the woods, not looking back. We got into his car and tore out, both of us sobbing. He pulled over, pulling into my driveway so I could puke. My boyfriend went home and we decided the next morning that he would go back to the site to get our expensive tent and blankets that we had left around midnight before. He had to work at 5.30am. When he returned, there was nothing there. 
No blankets, no pillows, no tent. We made no police report. I mean, what could we say? We were horny teenagers making horror movie decisions. My mom still asked about the pink and white fleece blanket I lost that night. I never have an answer. To whoever who was smoking a cigarette in the woods, listening to two teens having fun, and then scaring them and stealing their tent, that's probably the shittiest thing that's ever happened to anybody. I was working in the Czech Republic at a kid's summer camp when I was 20. It was nothing like the American summer camps I've seen on TV. It was much more relaxed. We owned a huge cabin in the forest just outside a small town. There were walking tracks around and people would walk past our cabin and field area from time to time. One day, I was doing some small crafts with the group. We were at a table that could be seen from the walking tracks when this guy walks past. He's alone about 30 and had dreads, heavy boots and these patchwork pants on and a loose metal singlet. He stops mid walk when he spots us and starts to approach. He asks me in Czech if I have any cigarettes. I tell him in Czech, I'm sorry I don't speak Czech very well in an attempt for him to give up and leave. I'm trying to be nice cause I have five kids sitting at the table and I don't want them to be scared. He then switches to English and I'm like, fuck. It was a 50-50 chance that he would speak English in a part of the country like this. He then comments on my tattoos, I have a sleeve, asking me all this stuff. Says he's going to get a new one soon. He asks about the cigarettes again. I say no and was polite about the tattoos but not encouraging conversation. He asks my name and I tell him and he keeps talking for a bit. After a while he moves on. I sigh with relief and the day continues. Later that afternoon, it was around 6, still light and we were killing time before dinner was being served. I was in the field outside the cabin and some kids running around. Other leaders were doing various activities with kids, when all of a sudden, another leader got my attention and told me to get the kids inside. I looked up on either side of the field where the trees start. There were a lot of guys dressed similar to the guy earlier standing just back from the tree line. They had spread out and approached from different directions. Then, I hear someone shouting my name. We move all of the kids inside and lock the door. The three male leaders we have go out to talk to the guys in the forest. My friend says they were just calling my name. I start freaking out. What the fuck? Is it the guy from the morning? I want to show her my new tattoo. Confused. The leaders come back and are like, who is this guy? They know I'm not Czech and I don't know many people outside of our circle, so they knew it was odd. I tell them about the morning and that I don't want to see him again. They go back out and tell the guys to leave after some fuss and yelling out for me again. They leave. For the rest of the trip I was paranoid that they would come back, especially at night. And luckily, they didn't. This happened when my dad was 16, all the way back in 1976. Him and my uncle Nigel were very outgoing and liked to explore to keep themselves occupied. When the summer of 76 came around, my dad finished school. He wanted to do one big bit of adventuring before he began work. The Pennine Way For those who do not know, the Pennine Way is a 270 mile walkway in Britain that, depending on which way you walk, starts in just south of Scotland and basically cuts through the middle of England and finishes in the Midlands. It usually takes around a three to four a week walk. With a long summer to fill, my dad and 15 year old uncle Nigel and my dad's friend Russ were dropped off in Scotland by my great grandfather to begin their hike. The first week went swimmingly. They met some nice locals who even cooked them food and gave them room to sleep in and generally enjoyed this whole new level of freedom entrusted upon them. They mainly camped in clear areas, but one day, they decided to cover an extra 5 miles in order to reach a village as they needed to buy some more food and get spare tents. They stumbled into a village around 6pm and saw the local pub was opening. After relaxing in the pub with some drinks, 
My dad tells me that the owner probably knew they were underage, but wanted all the business they could get. The owner offered to let the guys camp out in the back field of their pub. The landlady slash wife said the owner seemed oddly hesitant at first, looking a bit concerned and having a bit of a word with her husband in private. However, Yorkshire hospitality seemed to override any doubt she had after a night of heavy drinking with the locals. They resided to their tent. My dad says they were using an oil lantern hooked to a center of the tent as a light source, and when they turned it off, they left it hanging, which is important not only for what happened next, but also what happened the next day. My dad woke up and turned off the oil light while debating to get up and having a piss in the field, seeming as the owners had been nice in letting them camp out there, when he heard a door creak open from the creek shut. There were no footsteps, so my dad had to put it down to an old shed or something. After a few seconds, however, the sound of feet landing on grass became progressively audible until they stopped right outside the tent. My dad thought it was the owner checking in on us, and he went to unzip the tent. The owner fully unzipped it. My dad said the weird thing about this was that he didn't have a shirt on, just some slippers and night trousers. After my dad asked what he was doing, he stuttered out some excuse about hearing a growl and went to check if the boys were okay and safe. There was no growl as the only sound in the last five minutes was the door, the footsteps, and the unzipping of the tent. The guy weirdly emphasized the need for a good sleep before hiking and intrusively tapped on the oil light, asking for it to be turned off. He walked off, letting off a frustrated sigh and nearing the house and closed the door behind him. Morning comes and the owner's wife makes the boys some breakfast while they pack up their stuff. The owner takes down the tent for them and takes off somewhere in his 4x4 without coming back to the house. They thank the woman and tell her husband thank you as well. She says that when she figures out when he comes back, that he will tell him. They come to their designated camping spot, just next to a small stream, around an hour and a half early and decide to have a longer rest after walking around 130 to 140 miles over the past 8 to 9 days. They pull out the tent and find lots of small holes, all about a pen's width and wide. What's weird about this is my dad described the size of it as holding a pen while telling me this. Everyone looks confused, and my dad rationalizes this by the man telling him about an animal last night. It must have come back and nibbled on the tent, as uh, that explains it, sure. Russ suggests they walk back to a different village around two miles back and try to get another tent. They leave the now useless tent as a marker for their sight and walk back to the village. Their luck, a shop clearly targeting walkers is open. Unfortunately, they didn't have any tents, but they decide to buy tape and cover the holes for tonight and hope to find a new tent somewhere soon. When walking back, the sun had begun to set and it was quite dark. Moonlight mainly guiding them back down the path when they returned to their site, they couldn't believe it. Their tent was set up for them, but it was on fire, completely engulfed in flames. They threw the water in their bottles over the tent and used the stream water to fill them and eventually doused the fire. When they looked inside the tent, their oil lamp glass had been smashed and someone had followed them, set up their tent and waited for them to return before smashing the oil lamp and, in turn, lighting up the tent in flames. My dad told me that there really isn't an explanation except for the pub owner. He was stopping doing whatever he was planning on doing with my dad being awake and decided to take some fucked up form of revenge by sending a message. At first, I totally didn't believe my dad and thought he was trying to scare me, but upon referencing the burning tent incident in a phone to my Uncle Nigel, he instantly started rambling about how weird it was. My Uncle Nigel does not lie. This happened about a year ago, on a camping trip to Kentucky in the winter. My girlfriend at the time and three of my buddies went to spend a long weekend doing some hiking and camping. We drove in on a Friday night at around midnight and set up camp. There was almost no one else at this campsite besides a young couple a bit down the road from us and an older man down the road the other way. We unloaded the cars in the dark, got the headlamps out, and started setting up the tents. All of a sudden, my girlfriend noticed that she had an extra person among us. 
it was the young woman from the campsite a couple sites down. She looked really messed up. Her eyes were glazed and her skin looked like she had been picking at it constantly. She introduced herself and spoke in a sort of monotonous way. Overall, she seemed nice, but it's her boyfriend, or maybe husband, who really creeped us out. We noticed after talking with her for a bit that he was standing near our campsite at the edge of the woods just staring at us. Eventually, he went back to the campsite, but then got his car and pulled right up to us with his high beams on. As you can imagine, getting blasted by high beams at midnight in the middle of fucking nowhere really impairs your ability to see. His girlfriend said that she had to go and got in the car with him. At this point, we were all weirded out but not freaked out. It was later in the night when things got scary. I was in my tent with my girlfriend when I started to hear a domestic argument from the couple down the road. It soon escalated to full screaming. Then I heard the sound of glass break. At this point, my girlfriend and I are sitting up and deciding if we should do something. I hear someone getting into the car. The car then peels out of the campsite and races down the dirt road past our campsite, kicking up dirt and gravel against the side of our tent. The guy had apparently left his girlfriend in the campsite because we could hear her sobbing. My girlfriend and I start getting dressed so we can check out the situation, but the car comes peeling back up the road and parks back at the campsite. Loud, panicked shouting ensues and we hear two clops that sound exactly like gunshots. I remember the feeling of blood draining from my face. My girlfriend and I are basically frozen in our tent, listening. Finally, to our great relief, we hear them both start arguing again. The argument settles down by about 4 in the morning and we all fall asleep. When we woke up, they were gone. I asked my buddies if they heard what happened and they said it kept them up as well. We made breakfast and started packing up when the older man from the trailer walked over and started chatting with us. He seemed surprised that my girlfriend was with me. He said something along the lines of, You shouldn't have brought her. It's not safe for women here. Needless to say, we were officially creeped out and we found a new area of the state park to stay. We found a lovely lakeside campsite the next night and enjoyed the rest of the trip, but we were certainly jarred by the encounters. A little background on the events I'm about to write about. This all happened in mid-October. My family owns about 160 acres of land in the middle of nowhere. Closest neighbor is a friend who let us rent the pasture for his cattle when he needs to. Some friends and I decided we wanted to build a little cabin out there and that we would hang out at it. So, one weekend, one of my friends and I loaded up a tractor we were renting from his dad and headed up out there. It was just me and him that weekend, as everyone else was busy. We got there a little late, since it took a while to get everything loaded and packed for the weekend. He sat about setting up the tent and I made our fire. As I did so, I made an odd discovery. There was a phone book from a few towns over, still in his plastic sleeve, right next to our fire pit. I picked it up and showed my friend. We both enjoyed scaring ourselves. And I made the comment that we aren't alone out here, and we both laughed at it. Later that night, we were setting up around the campfire, talking and BSing. There was a big bright moon that night, and a bit of breeze which made the whatever leaves were left rustle. It was a little creepy, but we enjoyed the atmosphere. We noticed, however, someone crossing through the middle of the field, their body just visible from the moonlight. At first, it was a little odd. My friend and I discussed for a few seconds if we should confront him, but I made the suggestion that he was probably just taking a shortcut across the field. Although I didn't really like it, it wasn't a huge deal. If we caught him doing it again, then we would confront him, we decided. The rest of the night passed pretty uneventfully. We eventually got in our tent and laid down. We were probably 20 or so feet from the fire pit, which was by that point burning quite low. We talked for a few minutes, and then we go silent trying to fall asleep. As we're laying there, we hear something. It sounded like quiet footsteps walking around the fire pit. We both look at each other, silent. Then we hear a piece of wood getting thrown into the fire, and it flamed up quite a bit. I grabbed the shotgun, I always kept it in the tent, and quickly racked it. We then heard someone run away, but by the time we got out they were too far. The rest of the weekend was pretty quiet, 
and the events of the first night seemed kind of dreamy to us. We just cleared the area for the cabin, and cut the stacked trees and cut them for the firewood. Next weekend, we get out there. My uncle was out there as well, and we went to check his game cams. This is where it got much more worrying for us. My uncle told us he was pissed, because someone had stolen the batteries and SD cards out of the cameras. We told him about what happened the weekend before, and then parted ways. When we got out there, we noticed that quite a bit of our wood had been cut and stacked and it was already gone. And we were the last people to camp out there, which means someone had come out of there and taken ourselves. When we went and checked the tractor, which we had left down there, we found it broken into, and the chainsaw which we had left had been stolen. To make a long story short, nothing else so far has happened. I was hesitant for a few weeks to continue with the cabin, since we weren't there all the time. I was worried if it would be an incentive for whoever was there to stay. I'm not sure if it was transient or local or who. If for some reason anything else happens, I'll definitely update. I live in a very small town of about 100 people in rural New South Wales, Australia. This happened when my friends and I were 14. My town used to be a very close-knit farming community, but the shift to modern times and the massive drought of the 2000s led most of the businesses to be closed and farmers to move away. The aging population slowly died and their houses were filled with despicable types. Drug dealers and addicts, thieves and dole bludgers, it's sad, really. Even now, there are still great people here. What I've always found creepy is even though a very small population, and I've known just about everybody since before I can remember, there have always been people in the surrounding area that no one seems to know. Older loners, mostly, who keep to themselves and no one ever sees them. On top of that, there have been several pedophile charges led against some of them, and they have been numerous break-ins and attempts to break-ins in our home. Not to mention that for the long stretches of time we've been out without police officers, which means a 000 call would take an hour for any help to arrive. It gets even creepier the further out the bush you go. I've heard of abandoned farmsteads where families have just disappeared, with all their belongings, including cars, left behind. There was even a multi-generational inbred family reminiscent of the hills have I discovered a few years ago, though that's a few hundred miles from me. Anyway. I grew up and went to primary school here, but we had to travel an hour to go to high school. It took quite a while for my closest childhood friend, Tim, and I to make new friends. After two years of high school, we invited three of our friends to come out of town to come hiking and camping. Tim's parents owned a small property where they kept sheepdogs and horses a few miles from the town. We camped for five days there in the school holidays. The first night was what you would expect. We sat around the campfire telling stories. I told a story of some of those creepy loners I mentioned earlier, a pair of brothers that lived a few miles up the road that were camping. They were rarely seen, with the reputation of being a very creepy hillbilly hicks. I told them the story of how one night they had tried to cripple my father over him supposedly stealing their business. They ambushed him at the local way bridge at night. My father managed to fight both of them off. My cousin and I had also ran into them, taking a shortcut across their field, only to hear gunfire in his direction. My cousin has lied to me before, so I didn't really know if he was being honest. But I made it out like it was later embellished, that their reputation with the normal inbred cannibal type crap city folk expect. On the second night, we decided to go for a night walk. We were kids and enjoyed fantasy movies and games and had a bit of role playing fun. One of us though was too scared to go into the dark. So on our walk, we decided to play a prank on him. We started screaming and running back to the camp scattered, saying, He got Henry! It worked, and we caused our friend to get scared. Zeb, who our friend was, tried to climb an electric fence to escape. I had to come back dirty and bloody, and we hid from the farmhouse until Tim ruined the prank by claiming he heard the brother skin people, which caused us to burst out laughing. The next afternoon, we hiked up the nearest hill, called Sims Gap Hill. It was a popular walk for Tim and I when we were kids. The fastest way to get to the hill was by taking the dirt road called the Stock Route, which ran parallel to the main 
Tar Road, which led down to town. The two roads are connected by another called Sawmill Road, which was at the base of the hill. Anyway, we walked down the stock route, and I pointed out the Hillbilly Brothers property as we went past it. All you can see from the road are piles of rusted old cars. We reached Sawmill Road and walked across the paddock to the hill and had an enjoyable time. We started climbing down the hill as it got late, but underestimated the time it took to walk across the paddock to the road. By the time we reached the road, it was night, and of course it happened to be pitch black. As we started down Sawmill Road to the stock route, a pair of massive bright headlights turned into the road from behind us. Naturally, we got off the road, which meant disappearing into the thick patch of trees between the roads and the brothers' property. As the lights caught up to us, the vehicle started slowing. Up until then, we had thought it was a farmer's ute, but now we realized it was a very old, a very loud tractor. Not wanting to be questioned by any meddling adult, I encouraged the guys to hide. The tractor slowed right down and flashed a spotlight into the trees, and then sped away. The guys asked me who it was, and I said I didn't know. We continued walking slowly until we saw the tractor turn down the stock route and then into the brother's property. Now, I was unnerved. The tractor came roaring down the fence line, and I yelled at my friends to run. We ran until we came into the small, well-hidden ditch, which we jumped in and laid very still. The tractor stopped right on us and shined the spotlight over the trees. It didn't illuminate the ditch. Luckily, the driver stopped the tractor and got off walking over to the fence. I peered up and saw the silhouette of a dirty, disheveled man with messy hair standing at the fence line, looking around with his rifle in his hand. In a nasally, Aussie hillbilly voice, he yelled out, Where are you, cunts? We didn't dare move. I started thinking what we'd have to do if he climbed the fence and started coming our way, but he eventually turned around and got back on his tractor. I started with a groan and it rumbled down all the way. I got my friends up and we sprinted towards the stock route, ducking under branches and jumping over fallen trees. We hadn't quite reached it when the headlights were behind us again, roaring up Sawmill Road. We made it to the road and panicked. It was still two or three miles back to the camp, and we wouldn't be able to outrun the tractor. On the other side of the stock route was a state forest with tens of miles of twisting dirt roads and motorbike trails and goat tracks. Despite how dark it was with the strong possibility of getting lost, we dove in there. We hid as he went past us again, finding a forest road which led back to the general direction of the town. We followed it for a while, wondering if he had given up and if it was safe to go back on the stock route. Then he was in front of us, blinding headlights roaring down the forest road. We jumped back into the trees and decided to run. We ran straight past him, behind us and turned back onto the stock route and chased us again. He circled us four times, with us hiding then running, hiding then running. When we had gotten far enough that we thought we were close enough to camp, we ran through the woods and jumped back on the stock route, to be met by headlights. Tim's mother had come looking for us, finding our camp empty. She had finally found us and we were still a mile or so from the camp. We quickly piled in and she drove us back. We told her what happened, but she and my parents just said they're weird people and to stay away from them in the future. November last year, me and my friend decided to drive up a car to Scotland to do some fishing and eventually make our way to Edinburgh. After the first day of catching some salmon and brown trout, we stored our catchers in the cooler box. After contemplating whether to sleep in the car tonight, as we had left quite late to set up camp, at around 4.30ish and the sun was going down, eventually I said, let's set up a fire and cook the fish. I didn't drive all the way to Scotland to sleep in the car. My friend agreed as we set off looking for a spot to camp. We found a little wooded area next to a car park near a farm. We looked into it prior and apparently you can basically camp anywhere in Scotland as long as you left the place as you found it. So we grabbed all of our shit out of the car and started setting up our campsite. 20 minutes later we had a fire going, two fold up chairs and two tents up. My tent was out of view from my friend. This will be relevant later. We were glad we chose to camp outside 
instead of sleeping in the car, as we smoked a few joints and we reminisced about school, life, and etc. My friend struggled to keep his eyes open as I checked my phone. 2 a.m. he called it, a night crawling into his tent and zipping it shut. I sat there with my feet up on my friend's now empty chair, listening to sounds of the wildlife. I shut off the torch and had hung up on the tree next to us, leaving it in the darkness, apart from the burning embers from the coal. It must have been three or so minutes before I started to hear the crunching of leaves and snapping of twigs that seemed to be coming toward me. Being a quite rational person, I passed it off as a fox drawn to the scraps of food we might have laying around. I was quickly proven wrong when I heard a sniffle, like someone with a cold clearing their nose. My high quickly turned from chilled out to paranoia as I feel a heavy dread come over me. My mind raced. Why the fuck would someone be here in the woods at 2 to 3 a.m.? Why are they coming towards me? I slowly reached down the pocket and felt my heart drop as I didn't feel the smooth blade of my pocket knife. Shit, I must have left it in the tent. All the while, I hear the treading coming closer and closer and my heartbeat racing. Out of the darkness, I see a middle-aged man, clean-shaven, parted hair, around 5'10", slowly creeping toward me, almost in all fours like a predator, trying to stay out of sight. I sat there paralyzed, unable to speak. My mouth was so dry that I could hardly swallow. That's when I realized he hadn't even seen me. Being under the tree with no light source, I must have blended in. Also, with there only being one tent in view, I guess he thought my friend was the only one camping here. He got closer to the tent and half breathed and half whispered, Come on, do it, in a raspy voice. Creep the fuck out and unable to bear the thought of what he might do next. Oi! Can I help you? He jumped up in shock, and his whole demeanor changed. He looked at me mumblingly awkward as he scurried back out of the woods. I sat there, still trying to comprehend what had just happened and what I saw. Then I saw headlights of a car turn on and drive away. I woke my friend up, and he could not tell what had happened, but he could see how shook up I was. Without full explanation from me, he willingly grabbed all our gear and we slept in the car that night with the doors locked. This story happened when I was about seven years old. When I was younger, my family used to go to this lake in Arkansas called Norfolk Lake. We could go down there every year in July to camp, boat, and swim. It is always a great time. Although, this time, my mom and dad decided to go camping for three weeks. I don't know if any of you go camping or not, but after the first week you are pretty much done. At this particular location, there was this pretty awesome playground area that my brother, sister, and I went to pretty much every day. It had the works, swing set, jungle gym, seesaw, hurricane spinner, spring riders, tetherball, you name it, the playground had it. And the best part about this area was that there was never any kids there, so naturally, this is where we spent most of our time. A few days in, we begin to notice that this white van with tinted windows is in the parking lot. At first, we didn't think anything of it, but every single day it would show up. Nothing would happen and nobody would get out, but nobody would get in either. It would just sit there. It was a pretty weird thing. I was young at this time, so I didn't really think too much or bother to even ask about it, but I could tell my brother and sister were freaked out by it. What really scared us is that we would see it drive by our camping area very slowly a couple times a day. So we decided to go to this other playground that was a little more out of the way just to avoid the white van. This seemed to work. We hadn't seen it for about a week and actually had forgotten about it. Until one day. We were all hanging out at the new park with this new friend we made. I was swinging on the swing set by myself. I was kind of a loner as a kid. While everybody else was out catching frogs or something at this nearby creek that was not within eyesight. I was just chilling by myself when sure enough, here comes that white van. I am frozen. I try to scream out to my brother and sister, but they are too far away to hear. The guy gets out of the van. All I remember is that he was smoking a cigarette and had a dirty yellow shirt on. He is walking straight towards me. He lifts up his hand and motions me to come to him. Right when he gets about 30 feet from me, my parents pull up with our truck and call out my name. The guy immediately changes his direction and walks towards the woods. I had never been so happy to see my parents in my life. 
We grab my brother and sister and I tell my parents the whole story about the guy in the white van. We get back to the camp and start packing right away. We have not been back to Norfolk Lake since. What really scares me is that he would drive past our campsite every day, and he knew exactly where we were sleeping. So let me start off with a little bit of background info. I am a 14-year-old Canadian male, and this happened around a year ago. This story is nothing but the truth. Me and my grandparents are extremely close and have been all my life. So my grandfather is an outdoorsy, get off your phone kind of guy, and he pitched the idea to go camping in early August. I was kind of excited because I don't get outside as often as I should, and I figured it would be some quality time with him. That being said, we weren't going true camping. He wanted to go into the woods, but I told him about a nearby campground that we could go to instead. He was still thrilled, so we embarked on our weekend journey. Let me paint you a picture. Our campsite was a dead end, aside from the one next to ours. It was right near the lake. It was beautiful, but to our dismay, we had people right next to us. We did all the camping things, made a fire, swimming, and even the infamous, spooky stories around the campfire. We hit the sack at around 10 p.m., because there was not much else to do. As soon as my head hit the pillow, it started. The crunching of leaves on our campsite. We thought nothing of it at the time because the night was still young. Some assholes were setting off fireworks and others were having a raging party. Hell, even our neighbors were still laughing. I fell asleep for a while. 11 p.m. is when it started to get weird. The party was still on, but our neighbors shut up. So the crunching of leaves didn't make sense. It was consistent, so my guess is that the noise was footsteps. No one needed to be on our campsite, so falling asleep was a slightly bigger challenge. My grandpa seemed to be having an even harder time as he seemed to be on alert mode. Yes, I know we are both paranoid, but I feel like the paranoia keeps us safe. I wake up and check my watch and it's 12 a.m. It's starting to rain and the water is splashing against the rocks and the thunder in the distance is quiet enough to sleep to. Even over the sound of rain pattering as the tarp, I still hear the fucking footsteps. The unsettling nature of the situation starts to eat away at me. I wasn't scared, just creeped out. Sleep overcame me, but it didn't come easy. My grandfather finally slept too. A crack of thunder woke me up. Full-blown thunderstorm now. I felt relieved if I thought the footsteps stopped. But I heard the thump of wood. I don't know what the person did, but I heard two very loud knocks, followed by two large splashes. Fuck this, was my only thought as the footsteps continued around our campsite. I stayed awake until like 5am. Daybreak was near, but my heart nearly exploded when I heard someone fumbling with our tent zipper in the fabric. I see the outline of three fingers being dragged across the tent. My body shut down as my, as my blood just seemed to chill. The hand trailed away and became quieter as they left our campsite. I woke my grandfather up as soon as the sun came up. Before we left, I went to investigate our site. Lots of the ground was turned into mud in the storm, so the mass of the boot prints were very unnoticeable. But you could see many footsteps. Easy to say we dipped the fuck out after that, and that was it. A couple of years ago, my brother bought a large piece of land out in the middle of nowhere, about 30 miles or so from cell reception. It's quiet, there is no light pollution, no paved roads, and not a lot of people around. Shortly after he bought the place, two of my brothers, the landowner and another, me and our families spent a weekend camping on the land and doing our best to clean it up. People I used it as a dump, there were many downed trees and etc. On the second night we were camping there, I woke up in the middle of the night to take a leak. As I walked the bushes in the dark, I realized that I could hear faint music. This didn't strike me as odd because I knew my brother had a radio in his camper. I finished up and went back to sleep with no further thought on the matter. The next morning at breakfast, I mentioned the radio and music. Several other people recalled walking in the night and hearing the music, but no two people heard the same music. Finally, the brother who brought the radio woke up. I asked him about the music and he seemed a bit freaked out. 
He woke up sometime during the night and said he went outside to smoke and hear music as well, but I assumed it was someone else's. I should mention that he was the only one with a generator and a radio. It wasn't this radio that we heard, and it wasn't anyone else's either. I've been back several times, but I'm freaked out by that place at night. I have fun while I'm there, but I'm always aimed and armed, and I don't sleep in a tent anymore. I sleep in my SUV with the doors locked. It may seem kind of dumb, but realizing that everyone heard different music when there are no people, no functional radios, and no electricity is quite creepy. I worked in Alaska for a bit as a member of the park services. One day, we had gotten a call about some illegal dumping on one of the local trails. So myself and another employee went out to investigate. We were fairly deep into the trails. Not too many people around except for a few joggers. When we came around a turn in the path, as we were walking, my partner looked into the woods and said, What the fuck? There's a guy there. About 20 yards away, there was a white guy with longish hair crouched behind a bush, just kind of staring at us. The man noticed that we had noticed him, and he immediately stood up and stretched out his arms in the air, like he was just enjoying the day. He actually approached us, and it turns out that the man I was with actually knew the man in the woods. He was a local builder, or owned a construction company. In fact, he had built a deck for my friend the year prior. After they said their hellos, he mentioned that he just stepped off the path for a moment to take a leak. It was kind of strange, though, because we had seen him. That definitely wasn't what he was doing. But he wasn't that suspicious and my friend knew him. So, after making sure he wasn't illegally dumping anything, we started walking back, and he walked with us for a while. A few years later, I heard that the man we had seen had been arrested. Apparently, where there had been some sort of altercation with a girl at a coffee shop, or so I had initially been told. And he shot her in a robbery and was under arrest for murder. The truth was even more bizarre. The man, Israel K.S., was a serial killer who had actually abducted, tortured, and murdered the girl. After being arrested, it turns out that he had been traveling around the country, murdering random people for years. He would bury murder kits and come back, sometimes years later, to dig them up. They would include guns, cash, etc., whatever he needed. I went back later to where we had come across Israel in the woods to see if there was any such a kit buried there, but I didn't find anything. Others suggested that he might have been waiting to surprise a victim on the trail, but that didn't seem to be his general MO, as was my understanding anyway. Our encounter is something I've totally been able to explain, and since he's killed himself before trial, I likely never will have all the answers though. I've worked as a pack trip outfitter, ranch hand in the middle of a national forest, and spend at least a week each month camping. I'm doing dog mushing now, so I'm outdoors now in times when it's colder and darker and further into places that people don't often go. My story is a two-parter, with the first part being just past the New Mexico border into Arizona. Anyways, I see five or six elk cows burst onto the road and I slam on the brakes and swerve all the way off the shoulder of the road, but I can still almost hit one elk that was bigger than the rest. It looked like it was going to hit me straight on and crash into the front of my window, killing me. Like I heard something happen to a guy with a horse earlier that year. I felt this really calm feeling, and I felt like that would be the end. Everything fell slow, and I got a good look at it. It was the size of a moose, but it had no antlers of any kind, in the build of a typical cow. Cow isn't a female moose. The other animals were typical elk cows, but this one was larger and covered from head to toe in what looked like to be large gray wool, like an angora goat that needed shaving so bad that it starts to almost look like dreadlocks. Luckily, I get past it and see its head go over the roof of my shitty Ford Taurus. This is the moment I remember best because for just an instant, before its head went over the roof, I felt like it could see me, and it knew that I was looking at it, even though its eyes were covered in thick gray wool, and it hit the back of my car. My bumper had a new dent, 
but by the time I got out of the car and to see if it was good, it went into the brush. My friends think it was some kind of Sasquatch, even though it was certainly a small-footed quadruped and called it a Bigfoot Taurus. My wife says it was probably the spirit of death and that I died there, but I continue living on what in my mind wants to happen. The second part is that I was a few miles off the ridge that overlooks Strawberry in Utah, and I got this old aspen grove with this really thick aspen on both sides. I mention this because with a string of 12 dogs behind an ATV, there wasn't enough snow for sleds, there really was nowhere to go but forward. You couldn't guide the dogs through trees like that, so it was always forward till we got to the end and then we would loop, and that would bring us back on the trail to take us back to base camp. Which was an exciting thought because I'm using just a headlamp and it was late and cold, and then I saw it again, running on my left side in the same direction as us, but also towards us. I wish I would have grabbed a camera, but imagine the franticness of watching my dogs to make sure they didn't chase towards it or head off the wrong way. In dog mushing, you can never take your eyes off the leaders too long or something can go wrong, and to stop the team, it would make their shore go toward it and caught in the trees, so really the best thing to do was to go faster. Keep the dogs busy so they don't chase it. So... I'm just looking at it, at the pack leader, ahead of the team, a fallen tree or a cattle guard taken too fast can injure a dog just like a moose, at the creature, then reaching around in my emergency bag, back at the leaders and pull out my just in case gun, I click off the first two chambers, I keep empty, I have the gun pointed straight up in the air, and live ammo is ready to go, I really didn't want to shoot it, or even frighten the dogs with a gunshot, but it keeps getting close, so I fired a shot a few feet above it, and I hear it hit some branches. Then I look back at the dogs to see if they were continuing to be good. They were stuck in a thick growth of trees. I kept looking around, but that was the last I saw of it. Although the rest of the ride, I was jumping at shadows. Pretty crazy, but the craziest thing as that tiny moment though is, oh shit, it's death again but this time he's going to take me for real. I'm a park ranger here, and here's a personal story of mine that was pretty creepy. Me and my ex-girlfriend decided to have a date night since we both had the day off of work. So we did the usual dinner and a movie thing, and afterwards we decided we would go for a midnight drive. So, we drive about an hour and a half out of town going nowhere particular. We just knew that we were going to get it on under the stars. After scoping out a random dirt road, I took my truck down it and parked in and opened off to the side next to the forest. The entire area was surrounded by forest. After about 10 minutes of kissing, we decided to get down to business. So we get in the back seat and start tearing each other's clothes off. After about five minutes, headlights. Headlights are heading towards where we are, but not directly at us. So we are both rushing in an attempt to get our clothes back on, thinking for some reason it might be the cops, which makes absolutely no sense now. My pants are nowhere to be found and either is her shirt. Now, keep in mind, the closest house to the road we were on is probably 30 minutes away. We kept fumbling looking for our clothing and eventually found it and struggled to get them back on. The truck keeps getting closer and closer, but like I said, not directly at us, until we finally realize it's not somebody coming to yell at us off their property or the cops. In fact, they can't even tell where we are because my truck is black and I'm parked almost in the thickest part of the forest area. Finally, an old beat up F-150 parks his truck about 50 feet from us, leaves his truck running and gets out. He walks out to his truck bed, grabs his shovel, and starts digging into the ground. He did this for a good 30 to 40 minutes while we just sat there in silence. Afraid to move or speak on the off chance he hears us. He stops digging and lifts something out of the ground. It's a decent sized object, but it was too dark to see exactly what it was. He picks it up, places it in the truck of his bed, and goes back for the shovel and places it in the trunk bed as well. And drives off into the night. Me and my girlfriend decide that it's best to wait another 20 minutes before we start the truck. To this day, I have no idea what that could have been, but I really hope at the worst it was drugs.
Last summer, I had the amazing experience of working and leading tours in the longest cave in the world. After working there for a few weeks, I started hearing stories of some of the other rangers' experiences. I will share them in the future if I get their okay. Mammoth Cave has a long history of paranormal experiences. It is the place that inspired H.P. Lovecraft to write The Beast in the Cave and I have personally met rangers who have seen full body apparitions, had orbs that have flown around tours, and have been forcefully shoved to the ground while leading tours. My first experience happened just a few weeks into the job. I was trailing our most popular tour, the historic tour, and we had just made it to the second stop of the tour at Giant's Coffin. This is a place that a lot of rangers, including myself, like to turn out the lights and show the tourists total darkness. It is also known to rangers as a paranormal hotspot. As I said, I was trailing the tour, which means I was at the back, just watching over the tour. The tour was well behaved, and I was just sitting there enjoying the darkness. It is kind of peaceful. As I was looking back the way we have came from, down an area as known as Broadway, there is a place also down there called Cyclops Gateway. I saw a light. It was a bright light. It was like a pinprick of light. Of course, I thought I was just seeing things, so I held my hand up, thinking that if it was in my head, I should not be able to block it out with my hand. Surprisingly though, I was, and I just looked at it until the lights came back on, and before the group moved on, I went and looked where it had been. It was just a rock with nothing on it to reflect any light. I do not have any explanation for this. I have seen this phenomenon one, one other time in another room known as the Methodist Church, another known hotspot. At about a month after this, this happened, I was talking with someone and they all of a sudden pointed to Coffin's Corner. And when I told some of the veterans, they were not surprised in the slightest. Now, my next experience happened several months later. I was leading a different tour, the Mammoth Passage Tour and I led the group back to a room known as Raffinesque Hall. On the tour, I would turn the lights out there and tell the story of Charles Harvey. It is a very old story dating back to the 1800s of a man who got lost in Mammoth Cave for 39 hours. I won't go into the whole thing, back the short version is though, that he forgets his hat and goes back in to get it. He gets lost trying to rejoin his tour group and eventually his light goes out. So he sits in total darkness and silence. He starts to go mad and starts banging rocks together. It's because the rocks banging that he is found and rescued. Now when I finish the story and turn the lights back on, I am taking a few questions. Then back down the passageway we hear knocks banging together. Now I knew that my trailing ranger was back down there controlling the light switch and I thought he was doing it. So I played it off as a joke, saying it could be the ghost of Charles still lost in the cave. On the way back out of the cave, I asked him about the rocks and he said I thought you were banging them together. I later found out that he was about 100 feet down outside the passageway looking at old signatures on the wall when he heard it too, coming from back where we were. He has had his own experiences and I trust that he was not pulling a prank. Now, if I have piqued your interest in Mammoth Cave, go and visit. Ask the rangers if they've had any experiences. They might just tell you a story. If you want to go to the most haunted areas of the cave, come and visit during the summer and take the Violet City Lantern Tour. You get to walk by the tuberculosis hits where people withered away in the cave, hoping to be cured, and where they found a 2,000 year old Native American mummy who was crushed under a fallen rock. I'm a park ecologist. I was in the middle of a wilderness area. Some stupid grad student tossed up some hobo units in a Campbell data logger and didn't get a permit. Cue me walking 30 miles to yank them out. One of the most remote areas in the lower 48 of the US. Now, most of this area, even the non-wilderness, didn't even have radio repeaters. Really remote for someone who works in places like that on the regular. I rode in helicopters fairly often, I'd say where but I think that might dox me. Anyway, we came across a gathering of about 100 ultralight aircraft and paraplanes, a dozen jeeps, in the middle of a fucking wilderness area, partying beer the whole 9 yards. I was pissed. 
The ranger got his butt out there and wrote a whole lot of tickets. Another time, I was doing a survey or a clearance along a river in the desert. I had to take a deuce like a mofo. I was holding it because I was getting near town where they were dropping off our truck. It was only about five more miles, but I was prairie dogging it. I came around a bend and someone had a pipe dumping raw sewage into the drainage. Well, fuck it. I shit in the wash. A great big rock hard dehydration poop. A couple of days later my boss called me and my co-walker into his office. It was just us three. A guy in the fire crew had found a giant turd in the wash next to his father-in-law's house and wanted to know what it was from. He thought a mountain lion. My work of art was sitting in a ziplock on my boss's desk in a federal office. Word got around about that one. Years later in school, I mentioned that I worked in this office and location to someone who had worked at an AK, and they said at the same time they asked me if I knew the guy who the shit in the wash was. Now, I leave a little indication that it was a human, like some TP. I'm a park ranger, but I've never really experienced anything creepy while being one. But when I was 13, I was at my grandfather's hunting camp. My uncle had just bought a new hunting camera and wanted to test it out, so we set it up in the woods. I got the brilliant idea to go up in the woods with my two other cousins and moon it. So when he checked the card, instead of wildlife, he would see some ass cheeks. Hilarious to a 13 year old's mind, and after some convincing, my other two cousins were in. But we had to go over the counter of darkness. So we set our alarms at 3am and pass out. By 3.15, we all sneak outside, throw on our headlamps and start walking. We know the camera is about a mile away. The trail goes over two pretty big hills, and the camera is in a valley on the far side of the second hill. We start walking as normal, and everything is good. The excitement starts building, and we're pretty giddy that we're pulling off this glorious prank. After a few minutes of brisk walking, we get to the top of the second hill. My older cousin knows the area more than me stops as he gets to the top. As I make my way to the top, I see why. Off in the distance, about 400 yards, is a spotlight. It's bluish and white in color, and it illuminates nearly half the hill at this point. This thing was crazy bright. By this time, all three of us were looking at the light, and my older cousin tells us to turn off our headlamps. We stand there in silence. Me being the 13 year old pussy I was, started to get freaked out. Aliens is the first thing that comes to mind, and I tell him we have to leave. I turn on my headlamp and turn around and about to head back to the campsite. As soon as I turn my lights back on, the super bright blue light starts slowly to turn and stops right on us. No bobbing or movement from the light besides, besides just a slow, consistent, not pan over us. At that point, I nope out with my cousins right behind. I get inside and go straight to bed, pretty much freaking out. Flash forward to the next morning and all three of us go back to the same spot and then proceeded to go out where we thought the light would have been and there was nothing there. No boot marks, no lights, no nothing. To this day, we still have no idea. I had been out stargazing and was sleeping out in a park near town. No tent, just a sleeping bag and a pad. This was a fairly popular area for joggers, walkers, etc. I have found a nice spot in a field a few hundred meters from the top, obscured by tall grass and brush with a nice view of the valley below and mountains in the distance. It was very nice and saw some shooting stars. We heard some coyotes singing in the distance and slept very well since it was a warm summer night. In the morning, at the crack of dawn, I was woken up by one of the strangest performances I have ever witnessed. Above me on the hill, I could hear some kind of chanting. Due to my concealed location, I couldn't actually see what was going on, and I wasn't keen on moving to a better vantage point, lest I be seen by the group. A man's loud and deep voice was half chanting, half shouting in a language I couldn't identify. It sounded like Latin derived language and was definitely not Spanish, 
although he kept repeating a word which sounded familiar to Diablo, Spanish for the devil. There were the other voices too, but he was clearly leading whatever was happening up there. Eventually, he finished his chant or shout. There were some cheers and whoops, and the entire group silently departed. After waiting a while to make sure it was clear, I went up to where I heard the sound coming from. There was no physical evidence of whatever had happened. I asked everybody I knew in town if they had any idea what it might have possibly been, and nobody had heard anything like it. To this day, one of my greatest regrets is not peeking out of the side of my hiding spot to see what the heck was going on. From what I can tell, there was supposed to be a meteor shower that night, which is why we had been there. This was on the way to Willamette Valley in Oregon, and only about a 30 minute walk from a trailhead itself, maybe a 10 minute drive from town. Not a particularly remote place, nor a place of any particular native significance as far as I know. If anyone can figure out what that was, I'd be quite amazed. This was an estate wilderness area in the northeast, and nestled between uninterrupted miles of mountains, pine forests, streams, and no vehicle access. Only rocky footpaths with extra large rocks every once in a while in the beginning to blog out the possibility of a car or ATV or bike showing up. A road 2-3 to three miles away, but 10 miles to the next real road with traffic. About 7 miles to where houses start, but 10 miles to a real road with more than the occasional building, and 20 miles from any sort of town. Most of the oddities have been tree structures. One was a low teepee type structure of about 6 logs, that was off trail about a 2 hour walk from a small dirt that you can dump your car. My thought is someone had a tent frame out of logs and camped there. It was cool, deep into the far inner side of the wilderness. I've seen a long branches of mini logs stacked horizontally about 5 to 6 off the ground as well. I've also seen two trees next to each other that both fell over, but they still had their roots in, forming a big X. But the weirdest one was the jungle gym or high bar type thing. It was off a path, also about 2 hours down and up around a footpath that was very deep in parts where you had to hold on or risk falling backwards off the rocks. So, I don't see how someone could have carried any tool or ladder to do this. There were thick woods and very few fallen rocks, so I don't see how someone could have carried in any other tool to do this. Maybe it was a mini tornado, but six of them didn't really fall, they were pushed if that makes sense. It's like they were pushed in to make a structure, like you would hang a pig over a fire with or make a tent frame. There was a log with brush on it anchoring three logs together on the side, and it landed perfectly on the other end and rigged it into one knob on the living tree to its right. I jumped up and hung from it, but it didn't budge, and it held my weight fine and I weigh 185 pounds. The more I inspected it, the more I came to the conclusion that it was made. The log across the top was perfectly horizontal. A fallen branch can't get wedged in perfectly and on a perfectly horizontal line like that. That's not how branches fall, but more importantly, the log running across the top looks like it was broken off by the healthy, longer tree pushed down that it was resting on, but then it should not have fallen about 10 feet to the right and facing to the opposite direction. A tree gradually dipping down because its root system is muddy in soil doesn't fall the type of force that thrusts a tree on top of another one and to fling it 5 feet towards. So, I'm not sure what's making these. I have a lot of friends thinking that it might be Bigfoot or Sasquatch or something along those lines. What do you think? I'll tell you something weird that happened. Last year, me and a few friends were up at Mount St. Helens going for a snowmobile ride. It had recently snowed 3 feet, so we decided to go up for an evening ride. Well, when we got there, it was apparent that no one else had been up there riding, snowshoeing, or cross-country skiing since there were no tracks in the snow. 
The area we were riding into was next to the Clearwater Canyon on the 25 road. Anyhow, we took off that evening heading out all to the side roads, having fun and cruising around. After a few hours of riding back, we went back to the truck for some food with the bright starlit full moon night we decided to go out for one last night ride, which was pushing 8.30 in the evening. Well, the four of us proceeded back up to the 25 along the Clearwater Canyon when we noticed lights down in the canyon, occasionally flickering on and off. After stopping for a few minutes and looking down into the canyon, we could not identify what it was. The weird thing was, there is no way to get into the Clearwater Canyon unless you walk the three miles in, and there are no public roads that pass through it. After watching the lights, it looked like there was machinery or something working down there, but none of the lights made sense. It sort of freaked us out a bit, so we decided to get out of there. I was on the lead bike, so we all started our snowmobiles up and headed back towards the truck. We didn't realize that Chad had gotten stuck and was left behind. Well, when we got back to the truck, he was freaked. I'm talking so freaked that he was shaking and really weirded out. Chad's been my best friend since we were seven years old, and he's never in our friendship acted as if he were scared of anything. Well, Chad went on to say that we need to hurry up and load up and get out of here, and screaming that there's something up with a super bright light and it was coming for me on foot. Well, I guess when Chad had his snowmobile stuck, this thing, or human, came up out of the canyon towards him, and by the time he finally got to the snow machine running and unstuck, it was 20 yards away or so, pointing the light right in his face. To this day, we still never figured out what or who would have been that far off any road in the canyon with three to five feet of snow around. We still can't figure out why someone would be walking out of the canyon, which was two to three miles from the bottom, to where we were at 9.30 to 10 p.m. at night. The only thing we can think of is they might have been doing some military training in the canyon. Anyone have a clue what it might have been? In 1991, I was hunting the Tiaga unit and shot a four point at about 200 yards down a steep ravine. He was just up from the bottom on the other side, so I took the shot because there was a flat hike out following the bottom of the ravine to a road three miles away. No way I could pack the deer up and make that hike out there. It was a chore to say the least. But it was a clear shot and I dropped him later to find out that it was a non-lethal hit, but the deer slipped and broke its neck. A whole nother story. Anyway, I had a very early Elkhorn Handle Gerber folding blade knife in a leather case in my belt. My grandfather had given it to my dad years before, and my dad gave it to me. As I was sliding down the ravine to retrieve the deer, I followed a short blood trail that located the deer, went to grab my knife and gut it for the hike out, but the knife was gone, the sheath open and full of dirt. Not only was I mad because I had to make a decision to leave the deer until I could get a knife back to where it was or pack it out whole. After looking around a bit for the knife, I sacrificed my Tasco scope and broke out a piece of glass in the front and rock to use it as a knife. It took me about two hours to cut with fingers to gut the deer to the piece of glass. I broke the ribs open, tore my t-shirt into strips, and made a backpack out of the carcass, and packed it out. What a nightmare. When I got home, my father told me he got a call from my grandmother, said she had died of a heart attack earlier that day. I didn't tell my dad I lost a knife. I just took a quick shower and went back down to the ravine, retracing every step looking for the knife. When I got to the bottom, I had not found the knife. It was getting dark and I had a long hike out with a flashlight. I propped myself up against a rocky ledge and had tears in my eyes about my grandfather's passing. I wiped my eyes and looked down at my feet and saw that I more or less hoped was a tiny point sticking out of the sand. I brushed the sand aside from my foot and there was the knife. The sad part is, a few years later my dad mailed me the knife to my P.O. box in Reedsport, but he put the wrong box number on it. The postmaster refused to give me the name of the person who had the box, but later asked if they got a knife in the mail, and they denied it. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to give this video a thumbs up.
If you like these kinds of stories, be sure to subscribe to my channel because I upload videos just like this one all the time.